Good morning, church. My name is AJ. I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal, and it's great to be with you this morning as we gather to worship uh, is a response to God's goodness and the gifts that he gives us. Uh, that's what we're, we're all about here at Renewal, as a place where we can connect with Jesus and where we can grow deeper in a discipleship journey with him uh, as we seek to overflow these walls and to be people of hope and people of peace in our community. Uh, we're glad you're here with us this morning, whether you're joining us live uh, or you're joining us via the stream. We're glad you're tuning in uh, as we together seek to honor God and now to sort of soak in what we can from his word, from his gifts of grace. We've been going through this uh, sermon series on the Gospel of Luke. Uh, in Scripture, God's Word, there are four gospel accounts of the good news of Jesus Christ in which people wrote uh, from their perspective and Luke uh, although he was not one of the initial 12 apostles, he didn't witness, witness many of these things firsthand, he uh, carefully put together a, an account that he gathered from talking to all the people that were there. And he talked to many different witnesses and eyewitnesses. Uh, and he comes up with this account, uh, uh, the, his own gospel account, uh, which he writes so that we may know everything that has happened as we try and understand and as we try and soak in more of Jesus, the man who is God. Uh, today we are in Luke chapter 8, and in chapter 8 we have the parable of the sower. You may be familiar with this. The parable of the sower is one of the rare parables that Jesus explains. A parable is a, uh, a story with a heavenly point, an earthly story with a heavenly reality. And uh, often Jesus has some profound parables that he tells, and he doesn't often explain them. He kind of leaves it up to you. This one, you, we actually have in Luke's account, uh, the account of him later on explaining what the parable means to his disciples, uh, which is really cool because we, we can kind of glean from that. And so if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to tune, uh, turn to Luke 8 so you can follow along, uh, or if you download the Renewal Church uh, Denver app, you can uh, follow along uh, in there as well. There's a Bible built into the app. Um, but we're going to get started here. I'm going to read for a little bit. So just, you know, settle into your seat. Listen to the uh, manly yet silky smooth tones of my voice uh, reading to you this, uh, this great passage here. So uh, picking up in 8 verse 4. And when a great crowd was uh, gathering and people from town after town came to him, to Jesus, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell along the path and were trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Uh, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but those have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. And as for those, uh, for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not ma uh, mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. So in this parable that Jesus tells, there are four types of people that he lays out, right? And the, so there's the, the people that um, immediately, they, they hear, but they do not believe. They um, just can't take it to heart, right? Satan seizes the opportunity to create doubt in their hearts and takes it away. There are then the people, right, who uh, they believe at first and they respond with joy, but they have no root. So they do not have that moisture. They don't have a nutrients to nurture them and mature them uh, in their faith. And so they, uh, when times of testing come, they quickly wither away. They cannot stand in, in times uh, where things go wrong, right? And then you've got the people that hear and believe, but they go on their way, it says, right? Almost as before. They hear, but they don't necessarily put all into practice. They can be sort of nominal Christians and uh, sort of as, and we've all been there at times in our life, right? And as we go along, 
the thorns and the weeds that grow along uh, alongside that person are the uh, things in life that distract the things in life that take away from focusing on God and his priorities. And eventually, uh, that third person is choked out uh, by those other things that they have prioritized ahead of God's way. And then, finally, you have the, the people uh, that it says in, in verse 15, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with repentance. There are though, those that hear it, and they don't just let it fall on their ears, but they listen, they take it in, they take it to heart, and it comes out as evidenced in their lives. Um, in fact, uh, verse 15, another way of saying this, uh, if we look at a different translation, the God's Word translation, is the seeds that were planted on good ground are people who also hear the Word, but they keep it in their good and honest hearts and produce what is good despite what life may bring. And life will bring some stuff, right? Um, now, there's two questions that I had. Immediately as I, I read through the text, the two questions that kind of uh, stick out to me are, first off, what soil am I? And as you all think about your lives, where are you at? Uh, what right now, this week, what soil uh, are you? Is there anything that's choking you out? Is there any trial or temptation or testing that, uh, you know, is really pressing down on you? Um, and then, or, or are you feeling good this week? Are you feeling like, I'm approaching God with joy this week, right? Um, and, and secondly, what can be done about where I'm at, right? What, um, is there anything that can change where I'm at or make it even better, right? Um, what's interesting here is when I initially, one of the things that strikes me as I read the text is I didn't quite see all that God had in store here. And what I initially kind of saw was this text seems a little bit sort of fatalistic or deterministic, right? It almost seems like this is the way it is. You got people who are not going to believe. You have some people that are going to believe, but fall away. You have some people that are going to believe. And that's just the way it is. Good luck. Hope you're the fourth one, right? Um, and we can kind of read it that way. And, and it, it's like, ah, oh, it's kind of a head scratcher. And you're kind of like, why did Jesus tell this parable then, um, if that's what I'm initially taking out of the text. Um, but there's an important line that I think Jesus puts a lot of weight into and really reveals what he has in store for us in understanding this passage of scripture. Um, in verse 8, right after he tells the parable, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And Jesus, what he's actually doing, Jesus is the student of Scripture, of Old Testament Scripture, right? And so he quotes from Isaiah 6-9, uh, which says essentially that. says um, It's basically a prophecy that the prophet Isaiah is prophesying about people who don't seem to put God's word into practice, right? Um, and so this is not God's desire that we would not hear and put into practice, but often this is what happens with people. And the prophet Isaiah says, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Uh, we know from... Uh, you know, in the book of Timothy, that God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Yet often those thorns, those weeds, those drought times, they keep us from turning and being healed. Uh, and so this passage, I think, really drives home, right, um, that God, his heart is for us to turn and be healed. Our, well, the word repentance literally means turning away from and turning toward, and he wants us to turn toward uh, his son Jesus and to receive God's grace from him to be made whole, to be made anew in his image. Because this whole world from creation until now has been struggling under the weight of sin. That God created it good, we messed it up, and this whole Old Testament story has been a story of God's love, God trying to win his people back and ultimately culminating in sending his son Jesus to do exactly that. Uh, that God wants us uh, to not just understand the parable as that's the way it is, but on the contrary, his heart is for us to self-examine and to turn toward him in all things. And in fact, this, uh, his message of um, if you have ears to hear, let them hear, that reverberates through the whole rest of the chapter, right? So uh, verse 18, if we were to look at that, um, where am I, Minnie? Take care then how you hear. Verse 21. 
Jesus answered the people who asked him about his mothers and brothers. He says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and who do it. And you see this theme of don't just hear, but listen, keep going. In other words, are you hearing the words that are coming out of my mouth, right? Uh, Are you not just letting them fall on deaf ears, but are you internalizing them? Um, True hearing always results in action uh, every time. So I'm a parent. Um, If you are a teacher or a wife, you probably understand this as well. Uh, But my perspective of that as a a parent um, is that often with the kids, I didn't realize this coming in, but you have to teach them how to listen well, how to like really hear what you're saying. Because often I'll be talking, right? I'll be like, hey, um, you know, so-and-so, I need you to do this thing, right? And they're giving you no indication (laughs) that they're actually listening, right? They're still doing what they were doing. They're looking the direction they were doing. There's no verbal, uh, you know, yes or whatever else, right? And I'm like, I have no clue if this kid is actually hearing me, uh, if they're not hearing me, if they're hearing and just ignoring, right? And sometimes you get that like, yeah, dad, or okay, dad, and then they just keep doing what they were doing, right? Uh, They kind of figure out that, yeah, it kind of gets them off my back for a little bit, and I can keep doing what I have always done if I just kind of say, okay, you know? Um, But truly, true hearing, um, and I've had to teach them, right, is, okay, so either give me some eye contact, give me a verbal response, uh, or actually start doing what it is that I want you to do. And then I will know that you have heard me because true hearing always results in action. Uh, it's hearing, listening, taking to heart, putting into practice, right? Uh, Jesus, he actually took action for us. Jesus uh, himself modeled this really well, uh, that God, when we are in a, a desperate state, and the whole Old Testament, right, is leading up to this Messiah that's to come, right? In fact, in Nehemiah 9, which you could consider almost the end of the Old Testament, the people cry out and they say, God, we're in great distress. Come and help us, right? And Jesus comes uh, because God's desire and God's heart uh, is to take action on our behalf. On behalf of the helpless, Jesus comes, He comes, uh, and as a sower of sorts, right? God, when he comes and he sows, is a totally different farmer than the farmers we're used to. First off, they did not have motorized farming equipment back then, right? Uh, When Jesus was incarnate, they had to sow by hand, right? And when we go out to sow, we often will sow in rows so that we can control the irrigation, so we can figure out where our plants are and not step on them, that sort of deal, right? But the farmer, the sower in the parable that Jesus tells us, he doesn't do that. Um, He doesn't decide where to plant and where not to plant. The sower in the parable throws up the seed in the wind. It drifts everywhere. It scatters everywhere. It falls on the good soil and the rocky places. It falls in the thorny places and the weed places, right? It falls everywhere because we have a God of extravagant grace. We have a God who has more grace than we can fathom. He doesn't pick and choose what people to like. We're all made in his image. He loves us all. Uh, He doesn't pick and choose who to save. Uh, He wants everyone to have a knowledge of the truth and to come right to him. So he scatters everywhere. He scatters his life-giving word uh, to the four corners of the earth. He scatters it uh, to each you know, to all sorts of people. He doesn't say, oh, this person's maybe not likely to respond well, or this person's not likely to grow and mature. He doesn't discriminate. He throws his word everywhere, and we're a part of that. When we speak his word, we're a part of him scattering and sowing because his heart is to give all people a chance to come to know him. In fact, often we ask in our lives, like, why doesn't God do something about this or that thing in our life? Or just the sin in the world that we see, or the disasters that we see in the world. Why isn't God acting and moving? And in Second Peter, he actually says what he's doing is it's his heart's desire to, to bring all that to an end and to remake the world good just as it was in the beginning. But he's waiting. He's giving people a chance to come to know him, to come to know God their Father before he brings about the culmination of all things. It's a grace thing, right? Uh, And so God, he scatters the seed so that all people, including you and me, by grace and not by what what we have done, which uh, at our best is a bit flawed, um, but instead, he's a God of grace. He says, I want all people to come back to me. I'm scattering the seed everywhere to see where faith takes root.
Faith is really important. God bestows his riches upon us by faith, through faith. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 talk about this. It's by grace that we have been saved through faith. Everything hinges upon faith. And in fact, throughout the rest of the chapter, you kind of see faith playing a big role in the stories that are to come in chapter 8. Um, but it's by faith that we have true and everlasting life in Jesus. Um, and faith comes from hearing the word. Faith comes from encountering his gifts. Faith comes from being truly rooted uh, in who God is. That's how we get our nourishment. That's how we end up in category number four out of the four people, right, is what we are people who are rooted in his gifts and what he gives. Uh, Psalm 1 uses some of this language uh, famously. It says, blessed is the man or person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers because he is rooted uh, by a water source, a nutrient source. Uh, the man of faith or the woman of faith is rooted in who God is. I, often I think about, um, so when Megan and I purchased our first home in Arkansas, we purchased the home and they were not quite done with it. We, we loved it so much we pulled the trigger on it, uh, but there were still, like when they had come in, it was totally overgrown outside, so they had just like chainsawed all of the trees and shrubs down and everything, and when we bought the home, there were like 15 stumps that had to be removed. So word to the wise, put that in the contract next time, <laughs> right? Uh, you don't want to end up digging those stumps out. Um, but there were some, some shrubs that were left too. And one of the shrubs that was left was, it was down by the street and it was entangled with the gas main or the gas meter for the house. And it was like growing all around it and, and tangled up with the pipes and stuff like that. It was just a huge mess. And so I had to get to work getting this shrub out of there. And so, you know, you're hacking away at it. And, and when you're getting too close to the meter, you gotta be careful, right? Um, you know, you don't want the whole place to go up. And, uh, you know, using hand tools to get in at it. And ultimately, like, there were some parts I just, because I couldn't swing an axe at my gas meter, um, I, there were parts that were really difficult. So I borrowed my friend's truck and, uh, you know, I hooked, hooked the, the chains up to the stump and everything. I'm, like, trying to get it out with the truck, uh, you know, and I even, like, let the truck get going, like, five miles an hour or something like that. And then, boom, the truck stops. Like, the, the shrub has, like, still enough strength left in it that the truck can't, actually pull the sucker out, right? And so then I have to go back to it and, and start, you know, sawing away by hand. But in the end, what I figured out is I had a water, um, my main water line for the house was actually broken under the lawn, and very slowly it was leaking, and the shrub was like right near it. It was just like soaking it all up and getting to be like the most beast mode shrub ever. And I always think about that, and I think uh, the moral of the story is think before you plant a shrubbery. Uh, so just wisdom here coming at you here. Uh, but I always think about like, now when I think about being rooted, um, that's what I have to think about. Um, the, 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 truly, just as a plant demonstrates amazing strength and resiliency uh, from being rooted uh, by the proper nutrient sources. So we too, when we are rooted in who God is, uh, are people who can withstand uh, those times in which everything, uh, you know, goes just crazy right? We can withstand those drought times. We can withstand those times when, you know, there's injury or friends fall away from the faith, or we can withstand those times when we're having tough times at work uh, or our relationships are a mess or whatever it happens to be, right? Uh, when we are properly rooted. A uh, couple slides ahead, please. Um, rooted faith reverberates through chapter 8 and beyond. So if you were to skim in your Bibles or on your phone, you would see that the stories that come after are stories about the rubber hitting the road, about faith and how faith works throughout everyday life, right? And so we get stories after the parable of um, Jesus calming the storm, right? So they get in the storm as they're crossing the lake and the disciples freak out and they think they're going to drown and Jesus chides them and he says that they have little faith right? Where is your faith, he says. And then we get this story uh, of Jesus healing a man, um, healing a man who was possessed by a demon, kind of crazy, right? Um, you know, and that man returning to faith. 
We get the story of a woman who has had a medical condition uh, for 12 years. And she spent everything she had on various physicians. And she, she had this Hail Mary plan, right? Uh, where she was like, I'm just going to go up behind Jesus and I'm going to touch his cloak. And maybe that'll do something, right? And it's crazy, like it does. <laughs> like she goes up, she touches Jesus' cloak, and, and she, immediately she's made well, right? And like her faith, um, he says, your faith has made you well. Her faith ba- basically turned Jesus' cloak into a sacrament of sorts, which is kind of nuts to, to think about, right? And then you have Jairus, whose daughter is about to die, and um, someone comes and says, your daughter is dead. Don't bother Jesus now, right? And, and Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. You see, everything uh, hinges on faith. And in our daily lives, it's going to get real, isn't it? Think about the moments uh, uh, in your life, the tough things that you've been through, or maybe you're in the midst of, right? It can get super real. Like the, the stories that we heard of, right, of, of people having medical conditions or bad news, um, you know, even just this, the story of the father with the, the daughter that's on the deathbed. Like, when I try and put myself in that place, I'm like, that's a place you don't want to go. That gets real, right? Um, you know, this morning I was like tearing up even just putting myself in that position, right? But beyond that, we all know that we get into tough parts in life. And it is faith that we have a God that's there with us in the midst of it. He says, surely I'm with you until the end of the age. It is faith in a God who has won the victory for us, right? And so much as we, we try and do the right things and honor him, uh, his, his forgiveness covers over our sins. Uh, it is faith in him in which we get through those moments. And he works in the midst of those moments, not always but often in powerful ways to enrich our faith and to make it even more mature, even more healthy, even more um, thriving than it was before. Um, That absolutely, uh, we have a God who also wants us to sow as he has sown. So apple trees make apple trees, right? Uh, Apple trees make apple trees. They don't stop at just fruit, but they replicate, right? And so we too, uh, the the passage closes with we're to be people who bear fruit, who are healthy, uh, to be people who help to sow the seed of the gospel with our very lives, that just as Jesus himself made himself a seed of the gospel, and scripture says, right, that uh, unless the seed dies, the plant cannot come. Uh, And so we too, our heart is to follow after our rabbi, our sower, Jesus, to be sort of little sowers, to to be subcontractor sowers, uh, to be people who with our lives make our lives a testimony to the grace of God, a testimony to the truth and the goodness of God, and who with our lives are people who go and who do likewise. So this week I encourage us uh, to take that step of faith Wherever you assessed that you're at this morning, know this, that it can change. That Jesus tells this parable, and he tells us, he who has ears, listen, not because he thinks this is the way it is and you can't change, but because he says, I'm a God of grace. Uh, Wherever you're at now, I'm calling you to faith. I'm calling you to encounter uh, my grace through God's word, through the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, to be immersed in those to be matured in those. And in the context of Christian community, we believe community is really important, like through life group, through, uh, you know, maybe you're going through marriage counseling, you have a mentor uh, couple that you're with. Maybe, you you know, you have people in this community. This community has so many different ways in which we build into one another that wherever we're at on our spiritual journeys, we can be sharpened, we can be matured, we can be led to the source of all things that thrive so that we may not just live but live. Church, we kind of close today and we meditate on this week. Uh, Where are those moments in which God is calling me to, not just hear, but to listen? To understand that as hard as it can be, that his ways are right. We may not see the end, but he sees it. He knows what is healthy and good for us as the God who created us and loves us. What are those moments, what are those scenarios in life in which we go, um, I need to listen to this this week. And through that, the soil starts clearing. The rocks start moving out. The the weeds and the thorns start to be getting out of there too. We're able to help others with some of those things in their life as well by the power of God.
And so church, I'll close on uh, verse 15 again for this week. Um, the ones on good soil are they who hold fast, who hold fast and bear fruit with patience. We pray.